Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm here with Dr. Melanie Meng Shua. She is Assistant Professor in the Social Science Division at New York University in Abu Dhabi. Her research lies at the intersection of economic history and political economy. She has studied the rise of gender equitable beliefs and the deterioration of civil society in the context of Imperial China. By tracing the impact of historical events over time and in various institutional settings, her work isolates the role of values, beliefs and norms in shaping economic and political disparities. Another strand of Dr. Shue's research concerns the decoding of folklore and mythology as a new approach to understanding historical values. So, Dr. Shue, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Yeah, it's a pleasure as well. Okay, great. So, uh, it's interesting that you studied some particular aspects of the history of China, particularly of Imperial China, right? So to, to try to understand, I guess, how values, beliefs, norms, institutions, I mean, basically the role they play in shaping culture and economics and uh, gender, uh, gender values and stuff like that. So, um, could you tell us first what were the specific aspects of China's history that you studied and why you focused on those aspects specifically? So much of my work has lied in Imperial China, but it also it has this tangent that goes into the modern period. And usually if it follows this framework, then we can examine a historical shock or event that takes place in the Imperial China setting. So the nice thing about Imperial China is it has some homogeneous institutions mm -hmm. in the same way that modern China does. But it's unusual if you're going back in the history and the rest of the world, typically you don't see um, you don't see shocks taken in such a setting where you allow you to examine the exact forces behind it and also create a pretty concrete setting where we have rich historical data for us to examine the impact of the shocks. So this is one reason I have has triggered my interest in trying to exploit this previously un unnoticed and a little studied area as a way to study culture and how it evolves over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, does Imperial China have some particular traits that render it, uh, I mean, a special case for us to understand how certain values, social norms uh, and things like that changed over time? So one thing, um, so in terms of the setting, as I just said a little bit about um, because of this homogeneous context which allows you to isolate the other forces. Typically we absorb a chaotic environment, then there's this one shock comes along and it shocks other pieces of the society. And this creates a situation where virtually nothing can be studied without first isolate the influence of other factors. The nice thing about Imperial China, which typically is cited as a drawback of a society, is just been relatively um, standardized and, and in a stagnant, but it happens to be strings if your goal is to look at the impact of historical shocks on values. And another thing I guess is also well known, which is that this values shared by the Chinese, which is in some sense a single ethnocentric ethno group as being homogen homogenized before. So this also makes it easier to just think about what, what changed, what are the changes in the values after those events. So that would be the main reason. But it's also because like, there's actually a very good written history of this country, um, which is, again, something is little known to a larger audience. But as, as someone who has um, viewed my uh, knowledge and specialty in this area, and I found it uh, particularly advantageous to make use of those written records, which often send, set the benchmark to be really clear which you know both of the events we know so conditions before the events and after the events this is almost never happens in in much of the world um probably with the exception of, of western world mm -hmm. yeah you at a certain point there you mentioned the fact that many times it's really difficult for us to isolate 
the factors or the causes behind particular social or historical phenomena and events. Uh, and I guess that, that's an important point to explore here, uh, because uh, I would like to ask you, what are the kinds of sources that you draw information and data from in your work to try to understand how things changed specifically in China society and culture over time? I mean, do you look at what, do you study what people say, how they behave? Do you draw information from written records and things like that? What exactly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like a, um, a really good way to, um, to to summarize my like some of my ongoing work actually, um, so I started looking at mostly local gazetteers. So those are the records that are already been compiled by people historically by um, the intellectuals or the local elites. So this is a very rich mine of data. Um, it provides you with information on mostly on. Um, on mostly on economic and political conditions, but of sometimes also with information on culture. And just as you said, the more, my, my recent interest in China has been more concentrated on how what's on people's minds. So if there's an opportunity that I can examine, say how often people mention um, violence, right? So this is one of the new 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 projects I've looked at. So how do they um, do they use words that appears to come across as aggressive or showing aggressions or lack of compassion or describe events in the antisocial manner. So it has more conversion in that direction. Um, but yeah, so it's been a combination of more standard historical sources, which local gazette will be a good example, but also becoming um, less less used but also equally important and more pertinent to the goal of you studying the culture and the beliefs and the values even for the historical periods. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I was also trying to understand here when we talk about values, beliefs, norms and things like that, what we are really talking about because is it what people say, how they behave, the kind of shared knowledge or information that they have through written records and other types of sources like that. So, I mean, when we talk about values, beliefs, norms and stuff like that, what are we really referring to? So I think in terms of values, you can think of most of the questions related to what is being right or wrong, broadly speaking, fits into that category. Um, in terms of beliefs, I think beliefs will be much wider. So we, we hold a certain view, the view is more about values, but then you, you hold an expectation of how this, um, on average, so beliefs will be similar and tied to what we think of as an expectation, except that it also has a cultural component, which means it's not completely rational. So whenever we talk about the values and beliefs in their independent causal role under environment or surroundings, um, I think we inevitably bring in non-economic factors. So they can include those shortcuts and the heuristics. Basically, what we learned from you know, the parents' generation and the peers, but is not necessarily an outcome of the actual events. So I think that's I think what distinguishes this from and we say like beliefs in the psychology sense or in the um, no, in the uh, standard economics context. Mm -hmm. So you've already mentioned uh, the ways by which you approach the questions you're interested in the most. Uh, can you apply the same tools to understanding uh, ongoing or current events occurring in different societies or even to try to predict uh, what's going to happen in the near future, or uh, is it only applicable to uh, historical events? So um, that's the way I think about it. So there are standard ways to elicit beliefs. So there's some of my work that really shares a lot in common with experimentalists who study beliefs of the modern populations. So that is the part I think there's. I would more emphasize what's in common um, as in different. And then you can, um, there are certain methods, the like experimental methods that obviously cannot be used to study past populations. 
various methods more based on um, analyzed, um, mostly written down records uh, or written down records of um, oral traditions, which is related to the folklore project that can be used for both the past and in the current populations. So yes, our methods can be used to study the current um, populations as well, but then it's comparative advantage will be to study the past populations. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned folklore there. I, I know that you also study folklore and mythology. Uh, what are the kinds of roles or uh, that they play in society and what kind of information can we obtain from studying them? So I'm thinking of, so if we think about the sources of values, so there is you know, some of the obvious candidates such as religion, so there's obviously an important part of the values, but then there's also um, idiosyncratic shock from the current events, so people's values and beliefs actually does shift around. But then at the very core of this structure, if you're looking for things that's relatively stable and unchanging, then we usually find folklore to be a pretty obvious place to look at. Because, you know, for one, it's relatively stable. It, it doesn't, I mean, it changes in the content, but you still find the same folklore being told uh, 15, in the 1500s, it's still being told today. So it, has, it is relatively stable and it's usually taught to really young children during their formative age. For all those reasons, um, I think it's, you know, without showing any of the evidence, you certainly we come with this prior that the vocal might be the vehicle of transmitting those values. And when you actually look at it, and we, we find plenty of evidence that it is seem to be the case. Mm -hmm. And what is the role that uh, social institutions play in society? Because I guess that institutions are not exactly the same as individual people or even groups of people, right? They, they have some sort of special role in society. So when economists to talk about institutions, I think they usually refer to this the rules of the game. So they're looking at the study how these two individuals interact and, and usually follows a set of rules. And this is not necessarily written down. So you can also, you know, that's where we talk about in, informal institutions. And in fact, the culture can, can be included in informal institutions if we really want to. But here, obviously, when we talk about formal institutions, uh, the reason it's important is because it affects effect, effect how efficient the economic systems are. Um, but in, our, in my work, institutions is more in the background because we try to separate those formal institutions and the cultural values. So my work centers on the role of the, um, the cultural values and the institutions is used to isolate the role of the cultural values. So give you an example. So in the case of China, during the socialist period, the institutions are centralized. So that just takes away the role of institutions automatically. And what's left is more likely to be attributed to two differences in the values. Mm -hmm. So when, when I study gender norms and study its persistence over time, I was able to use this socialist period as an, as an arbitrary. So during this period, there were gender roles or no, gender roles cannot be made equal, but laws and institutions applicable to the women, the men versus the women, those were already been transformed. So then if I still observe differences between men and women, it's more likely to be caused by uh, different values and beliefs about them. So institutions in my work is, is really is just be you, um, being raised as an alternative explanations and, and being ruled out. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's go back to some specific topics that you studied related to Imperial China. So f first of all, just to contextualize the question, uh, what is the period we are talking about here when we mention Imperial China? So Imperial China encompasses about 1500 years. So usually we think about since the unification of China, which is more, more than 2000 years ago, it broadly uh, falls under this umbrella. But, but uh, most of the work and, and data available is usually for the period after 1300. So both of my projects are referring to um, in China up to the 1300s, so this is roughly um, is the same period as early modern U Europe. So in pro-China, um, yeah, and mostly the early modern period I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so what, what was the dominant political system and economic system that were in place in China during that period? So during this, um, so, so at the 1300, the major events that took place in China was the Mongol invasion. So that was also the beginning point in, um, followed by about 700 years of unification. So when the, when after 1300, the China has always been unified as one country uh, under the central centralized authority. So this goes back to um, the motiv- motivation for studying values in the context of China. So one of the reasons is because since the centralized institutions are in place, then we don't have to worry about the, the differences in institutions and the differential responses to historical events because of the differences in institutions. Mm-hmm. So, and when did the imperial period end exactly and what came after that? So in 1911, we see the fall, the fall of the, the Qing dynasty. So my work mostly in the Qing and the Ming period, but it extends to the modern period as well. But yes, after 1911, then you see the democratic of the, it was actually a republic, um, but you see this transition into the more modern uh, institutions. But then it was followed by um, the communist period in starting in 1949. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and the communist period went, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the communist period in China, uh, do, do you consider that it's still ongoing because the dominant party in China is still the communist party right so so but but i guess that after mao's death china's society and politics and economics changed uh, significantly right um so yes in my work i do separate these two periods so there is the post-1990 period, so in terms of economics mostly, so I understand the political angle, but in terms of economics, there is a big change in around 1990. Uh, it became much more relaxed, so the degree of centralization went down, um, and the, the level of the control state had on the economy also was reduced. Um, so yeah, so I would think before 1990, it was much more strict a form of state, state, social, um, state socialism than mm-hmm. after. Mm-hmm. So uh, I know that uh, in regards to imperial China, you studied uh, or you studied the deterioration of civil society. So when did that occur and what were the factors and causes behind it? So, so in the paper, I'm mostly looking at the political repression in the, the autocratic region. So most when when most people talk about China or think about China, they think about 20th century autocratic, autocratic regions, so, uh, which is certainly um, which is certainly also important. Um, um, but I think mo- we don't we haven't paid enough attention to the roots of those autocracy. Um, so China, one of the reasons. The autocratic regions have been uh, surprisingly resilient is because it, it finds its um, very plenty of cultural relevance in, in its remote past, which is something that's been kept telling, I mean, being kept told to the people um, you know, in school and everything. So then one of the historic, more historical events, which is rather significant and is still freshly remembered by many generations of Chinese as the period of the literary inquisition. So it has a lot of common with the modern events uh, where individuals can get persecuted for what they say and what they think. And it is also a little bit surprising given this is a still a pre-modern region. It, um, it had this sufficient state capacity to target individuals for speech and thoughts. I mean, I think in some sense, it has shares an element in common as the Spanish Inquisition, but with the difference it's been more targeted at the um, descent, which possess a subversive thought and be deemed as potentially dangerous to the region. So it doesn't really have the religious religious components uh, in the same way the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
So just to try to understand how things changed over time in China from imperial China to communist China to modern China that, I mean, as I said, it's still the communist party that dominates there. But anyway, um, how did social organization and probably things like economic inequality changed over time? For example, in terms of economics, did, did economic inequality drop over time or how did it go? So, so um, just as a caveat, so, so yes, um, in my work, a lot of this is really focusing on how does the cultural values and beliefs contribute to these differences. But that said, it's not saying uh, yeah, those work is able to explain the inequality itself, which right now obviously is huge in China. Um, it has it has really widened. The income gap has really widened in the past twenty years, as the economy took off, um, as the economy took off, um, which is really a separate issue. But I'm happy to talk about it. I might not be the best person to talk about this. Um, because there will be people who study economic growth as their main area. But, but yes, um, inequality in, in China, it is a major issue. And um, it has has happened in, in an interesting way because both has, you've had the large shares of populations being lifted out of poverty mm -hmm. in this past 20 years. But at the same time, the Gini coefficient in China has, has really risen through the roof. Um, so it is both going to have less people being uh, in the extremely um, destitute state, but it's also having a, a rising income gap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, uh, let me just ask you this, uh, just to contextualize and to understand things a bit better. Uh, during imperial China, did they have feudalism set in place there, or...? So, feudalism might be a misnomer. So, in, in our, in, when we were in school, we were taught that the China was in a feudalist period, but it wasn't really the same kind of feudalism we, we know, we know a, say, like, in the context of Western Europe. Mm -hmm. China did not really have those landlords, which had the hereditary power over the lands, um, so it was actually surprisingly um, equal um, in in terms of land ownership. Um, it's largely due to having those um, those dynasties usually at least the most no at least the period I study after thirteen hundred there happens to be um, those emperors coming in and distribute land, uh, which is even more true for the Ming Dynasty. Um, so yeah, so I wouldn't say it is feudal. Um, a lot of peasants had land themselves, so they were landowners. Um, so in my textile paper, I actually exploit this fact that those textile producing households, they actually owned the land, but also owned their machinery, which is really uncommon um, by the pre-modern standard. So in Peru, China, I would not say it is feudalism, but but at the same time, um, ordinary people or Actually, pretty much everyone, you not really have political rights either. So it is a, it is hard. It is similar. I, I think it is. I, I have to comment. It's probably a little bit more similar to some of the other ancient empires, such as like Ottoman Empire or even even earlier, like the Egypt or Babylon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's just talk about a specific kind of value or belief that has to do with gender. So uh, how did uh, beliefs about <clears throat> gender changed throughout e China's history? So um, so again, so the part I was able to explain, I would not claim that I am talking, no, I'm able to explain the entire change or the variation in the gender norms, but sure. I think you very quick the walks through to about the Chinese gender norms. Um, so it is, um, so it was, a lot of us knows that um, it had a pretty conservative gender norms and it took a worse turn um, around the 1000 AD. So that's a time when women start to see, you know, lose some of the inheritance rights and everything. Mm -hmm. And then the later was followed by a period of so a high degree of commercialization and, and women continue to 
you, you continue to see some of the improvement, uh, especially you see like the purchasing power of the women have gone up. So in my paper, I'm really you know, looking at this as you know, part of the evidence that women were became um, independent income earners as a result of uh, the increasing productivity in the cotton weaving. So they were able to afford more. So you will see material in terms of material um, conditions has improved. And possibly because they also contribute to the, the household, um, to the economic production. So their status also increased for that reason. So you see you see contradicting forces going on. But on one hand, you, you see this clear cultural conservatives in which throughout this entire period we're talking about. So it seems like 1000 AD, I was, was a character, and it was characterized by cultural conservatives and also include uh, these women in losing some of their rights. Uh, but at the same time, you also see economic empowerment because of the their role, their increasing role as the as the uh, the producers of economic resources. Mm -hmm. So th this is very interesting the, that you separate those two domains. So um, when you mention, for example, the emergence of gender equitable beliefs in China, are you referring to cultural beliefs, I mean, how people think that women should behave, what's the role that women should play, uh, what's the place of women in society and things like that. Uh, or are you also referring to things like women having access to work and being able to have their own income and uh, property and things like that? So, um, so what to a nice thing about this is that I can actually separate them um, in 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 my paper. Um, historically, we're able to look at a pretty controlled setting, so you don't really see many of the legal changes. You, know, you don't really see like a massive expansion of rights in the way you see in the past two hundred years. Um, instead, you see is an increasing view that they are capable. So that's re really the focus of the paper, and I think this also is what the conservation lies in, because. The, this simple change in viewing women as capable is actually incredibly rare. So if you look at the survey data of the US in the past 40 years, you see changes in many of the things you just said, and like access to work and um, the freedom they should enjoy. Um, but if you look at, do you think women is just as capable, a simple question like that, um, it has been very little change. Uh, and the same thing is can be said about the traditional image of women, say like women doing housework, um, that is also an area you don't really see much of the change. Uh, and in my paper, I show that the Chinese woman, despite the lack of uh, change in the legal environment, which is definitely true in the imperial time, but you do see um, there is less use of dowry, for example, so as they become economically more useful. Now there is less of the demand for dowry. And then you also see there clearly is showing more more powers or it's showed by their um, the bargaining power is in the household. Um, fortunately, I can't really look into more than a few things in, uh, in terms of the change in the historical norms. But yeah, I do find evidence that places with this cotton, um, cotton revolution, with this improvement in their income in the past, which is no to the level that to be comparable to the husband, well, which really qualifies them as a, as a breadwinner. So you do see places with such traditions in today's context when you have a lot more data to look at. There are the places to think women are more capable or just as capable. And it's, um, it's more likely to prefer daughters uh, in the extreme case. Um, but also uh, having a higher level of the education it's largely due to investment by the parents and, and more likely to hold top jobs, um, becoming the company CEOs. Uh, so those are the aspects I, I have been able to look at and, and attribute to the historical intervention to women's incomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so could we say then that, um, I, I mean, do, do you think that it was the fact that uh, the economic land sphere, uh, or, or uh, yeah, the land sphere uh, changed, and then that led t toward the emergence of 
more gender equitable beliefs in society that it wasn't really necessary for people to change at least drastically their cultural beliefs for women to acquire a little bit more power in society let's say yeah i mean the paper um, i think i'm glad you asked this because it, the paper really shows an alternative path both to gender equality and to the to how you transform those beliefs so normally we believe you know if you're in a society of it's built around a consensus. So what, what happens is you have to like having a debate and like I convince you and therefore you agree with me that not women and men should be equal. So there is that. We we do observe this and in especially in democratic countries, um, you first see the change in legal rights, um, which is the outcome of those debates and then um, the norms may or may not change afterwards after the, uh, the legal status of women changes. But in my paper, it really documents a very different path, which is people, they gradually change their view about women based on what, what they can accomplish. And once they change those values, then, then it seems to be really sticky because this is, a, I guess, in the nature of those, those values as being relatively um, binary because so people actually just think about women and men and then they have been either equal or not equal. So once they change their view and observe women as being also high performing, and it seems like they don't really, they really don't really goes back uh, all that easily. So they're going to continue to believe women are just as capable and worth investing in. And they also, um, when you have the later periods where there is more increasing economic opportunities or learning. Um, and in a more industrial economy, in a more modernizing environment, and then women in those places uh, where the norms and the beliefs have already shifted, uh, is a lot more likely to take advantage of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, but that's very interesting because we could think that even though some economic activities change, then then favored women, let's say, or at least empowered them a little bit more, that uh, people could have simply rejected uh, allowing for women to, to, uh, to go into those kinds of activities, right? And then probably... Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for that reason, the imperial context, um, so in some sense, it might reduce the external validity of my argument, which is the reason why we see those beliefs and changes over time is because you don't, the local society didn't have a way to push back on women or to, to prevent this. So the reason why this did not happen, there's two things. One is the economic empowerment at the time was so specific to the incomes of the women. And it didn't really come with the other changes we normally saw, which is um, women marrying less or marrying late or having fewer children, um, precisely because the work took place at home. So it is a bit different than intervention. Um, um, to begin with. But moreover, it is also because the societies were not really making laws locally. Mm -hmm. So th this is another thing I think it's important difference to note between the context of imperial China and and where you have a locally organized movement. Um, so yeah, so for my purpose though, you can, you can, it can go both ways because even that much of economic change, what could have happened is um, it might have or have, might have shaped the local organizations or institutions in a positive way in favor of women, and that change was absent because there was limited institutional capacity to have to see those changes to materialize. But if what you said was true, yes, thanks to the centralized institution, and there wasn't really any possibility for those local movement. Uh, going in the direction against the women's um, rising status. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so you focused your studies particularly on the transition between imperial China and what happened after that, after its end, let's say. Uh, but uh, do, do you know if uh, what you said about uh, gender beliefs that people hold in China society still applies today. That is that 
probably women are more economically free than before in imperial China and so on, but uh, in society, in China society in general, people still hold some traditional views about women's role at home and things like that. So, um, so there's several questions there. Um, so for one, I think there's definitely still see that the trace of a traditional views about women, but this is obviously true for all societies. So typically we, we tend to think this is not true, but you see this, uh, you see the residual and the continued influence of traditional values. Um, that's part of the reason you see so much variation in gender norms across the world and it's not necessarily correlate with um, economic development. Yeah. In the case of China, you still see um, the Confucianism is still pretty powerful predictor of what women should be doing in their proper place. Um, but then the more modern shock, which is mostly socialism, that definitely has made women more equal to men. And usually, typically under socialism, women are obligated to participate in the workforce just like men are. Um, so in terms of legal status, it's all made equal as well. Um, but the question about the change we that happened in the past because of the economic intervention, or are they still relevant for today? Um, mm -hmm. So most of my paper shows that is the case. Um, and I try to also document this change over time so that we have a better, we're we more likely, um, we're more sure that this is, a, this is the same exact impact that you observed just after the shock um, and now. So there is pretty convincing evidence that the Cotton Revolution that resulted in this set of changes, which I document for uh, 1600 China, 1700 China, 1800 China, uh, is still applying to today. So we for, we see the change, we see the differences in sex ratio at birth between places with the Cotton Revolution and without. And then this is the change through econometric semesters that can be attributed back to the 1300 shock. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, do you know if uh, gender equitable beliefs increased in China over time, particularly after the uh, 1990s, where, as you said, uh, several changes, particularly economic ones, occurred and the market became a little bit more uh, liberal, I guess. Uh, I, I mean, uh, b b because China is a little bit of a complicated case, because uh, even though it is sort of a, cap a capitalist, it is state capitalism that operates there, right? So, yes. Um, so, um, overall, so this is not just my paper, but um, many, many studies have actually showed that women or doing better. So like the, the degree of gender equality is actually higher in the socialism. So this is also showed that, um, so it's not a focus on my paper, but it, I'm, I think it's, it's largely the case that after 1990, uh, we don't, we cannot assume that just because the economic, uh, there was the you know, economy being liberalized, therefore women also have a higher status. I, I do not think this is the case, um, but you do observe that there is an increase in equality after 1949. So this is also showed in the paper. So I look at the, the head of the gender of the head of the household. So in the case of China, and this is again, it's ideal to look at during socialist period because it wasn't really official property holder. So when we look at head of the house, household, we're really looking at who has the informal control or who have the you know, had more say, um, perhaps, in those in the household. And that is the one where I look at and you actually observe after the state socialism, um, after the after socialism was implemented, um, there is there is an increase in, in the chance that the women were the head of the household. Mm -hmm. Or the wives actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do those value or beliefs manifest uh, at, at levels like, for example, uh, let, let's say, um, do women in China nowadays uh, have more more legal legal rights? I mean, it's easier, for example, for 
uh, women to obtain a divorce and th or, or to get yeah, property yeah. and things like that. So, um, so this is all this you have just mentioned that is actually a change that happened after 19, 1949. So mm -hmm. much of the analysis I do in the paper is all post 19, 1949, which means we look in at the context of when the legal rights uh, for women or fully established. So post-1949, there's no longer differences in rights to inherit or you know, rights to marry or divorce between men and women. Mm -hmm. So the state managed to take away this uh, from the family and then made individuals free to marry, which, which used to be controlled by the parents. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so there has been um, since 1949, in terms of the official formal rights between men and, uh, men and women, it was already made equal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, so let me just ask you one last question, uh, because the, the, I find this very interesting. So since it was basically the state back in 1949 that uh, changed those kinds of things and that allowed for women to obtain certain legal rights that even went against the dominant or the hegemonic culture back then. Do you also find that, at least to some extent, uh, there's some, or in some ways, there's a tension between uh, how things changed because they were changed by uh, the state and the cultural values, beliefs, and norms that uh, society and people in general hold. I mean, because I, I guess that even though women were granted access to some rights, if the cultural values didn't change that much over time, then the, uh, there could be that kind of social tension, let's say. Um. So this is really interesting. Um, so what you can see is at the absolute level, um, both in terms of the institutions and the laws itself, but also the cultural values, at the, at the absolute level should have all be improving over time. Um, what I can still find is the, the cross-sectional difference. So, so a lot of our mm, Going back and forth is really about this two type of variation, um, and then the cross-sectional variation is where we can explore those differences. So that was the fact that you still see cross-sectional difference suggested that this state transformation is is absolutely not complete, because if the state transformation of those legal rights and uh, is is sufficient, then you should no longer see those differences across of, across um, different parts of China. Do we do, do we still do, which means no more conservative places has continued to be more conservative, irrespective of what law says and what what rights women have freshly obtained. So you see both. So on one hand, that extension to rights of to women has has actually um, improved their status. So this this is this is pretty cre clearly documented. So the cohorts born in 1930. Uh, have a lot higher chance to be the head of the household than the cohorts born in 1910, for example. Mm -hmm. So this is evidence that uh, state socialism or grant, uh, giving women rights, the same rights as men, uh, was improving their status. But at the same time, the place with conservative gender norms or was free from the, the cotton revolution, they, they still had fewer women who would be in the head of the household. So it is both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so I guess that, that's a, a very interesting thing to keep in mind when we think about uh, gender rights and gender equality, because it is not only that we have to change uh, the legal system and the political system and also probably how economic activities go around and things like that, but uh, the, the people in, in a particular society can keep the values or beliefs that they have and that may still be an obstacle for women to obtain certain things or to or, or even 
to, uh, to, to satisfy certain needs, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess one of the contributions of the paper is really to show that those, that, that part of the, the gender inequality, it, it really is very significant. And they continue to explain this very ancient, um, in such a consistent way, and even strong, powerful forces like state socialism doesn't really remove them. But at the same time, it also suggests there is room for change, because the fact that the Cardinal Revolution did change those views, uh, even though it took about 500 years, so it's just the last promising part, but it shows that those sustained change in economic conditions um, by a a significant margin, right, does ultimately um, contribute to the transportation uh, transformation of the norms. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I think it depends on what we expect and what, what do you believe to be the satisfying um, answer, which is if we think this is evidence that those norms and the beliefs is, is really is, is central to explaining this gender equality um, and to, in order to actually have inequality we have to also change people's minds then yes this is a paper that shows that we definitely see the importance of those those norms and the beliefs um, but then the paper also at the same time suggests that we can change those norms and those norms do adapt and the economic forces mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Dr. Xu, let's end on that positive note, I guess. And just before we go, would you like to tell people what are the best places on the internet where they can find your work? And um, so I have um, lot, um, almost all my work um, available on my website, uh, but then there is also a few working paper series where I store my work. Uh, so you can find my work on um, melanieshu.net, which is the same place you can look at, but it's also available on the SSRN and Array Pack, um, and also, well, no winners of uh, seminars, um, usually schools will be, or make those drafts available, um, but, but I try to have my work, website up to date, so if you're interested in my work, you can always go to my website and find the latest version. Do you have any social media like Twitter or something like that? Um, yeah, so you can also find me on Twitter. So we're very, very much welcome to follow me. Um, so I Twitter totally handle is Melanie um, Xue, as, but with also um, a divide in between. So you will be able to find me. But it's also on my website. You will be able to see my Twitter handle on my website as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Shu, uh, thank you a lot again for taking the time to come on the show. It was a really fascinating conversation. I know very little about China, so I learned a lot and I hope that my audience will also learn a lot with this conversation and uh, it was my pleasure. So, Thank you, thanks for inviting me. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end and for coming to my channel. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields, top academics and intellectuals, as you can see on the channel. And uh, I mean, I've I've been having an ongoing fundraising campaign and you can also support me regularly via PayPal or Patreon. All of the links are in the description box of the interview. And also if you want to give me a one time or several times big donations, all of the links you can find there. But please, if you can support the channel because it's really important for me to be able to keep it keep it sustainable and to keep it running so otherwise and if you like what i'm doing please share it leave a like and hit the subscription button i would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and supporters the main ones karen litzke and blanchett peruga larson law guerrero francis ford Hans frederick sunda Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, 
Tim Hollacy, Henry Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Boa Weingard, Rebecca Neuber Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Max Belby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Simon Columbus, George Spinha, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, my producers, Isar Weber, Rosie, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, and Matthew Lavender, and my executive producer, Michel Rugieski. Thank you for all.